Activist Radio is on the air. You have tuned in to the Mark Harrington Show, sponsored by Created Equal. Mark is training a new generation of leaders to take on the culture of death and win. You don't like abortion, don't have one. The only thing that can be said to be objective truth is that there is no objective truth. It does come out in one piece. It comes out in one piece. I would argue that we certainly are not all created equal. And now, here's Mark. Hello, Mark Harrington here coming to you from the Created Equal Studios here in Columbus, Ohio. And today I have as my guest Nancy Piercy. And Nancy is a, she's a former agnostic. I learned that today. Uh, she studied in Heidelberg, Germany at Labrie. Now, if you've been around as long as I have, you know what Labrie is all about because that's where Francis Schaeffer was teaching a lots of people early on uh, in the awakening, if you will, to, to the cultural wars that were taking place in America. And she was, um, she was studying there in Switzerland with Francis Schaeffer. She's also a professor at Houston Baptist University and author of several books, uh, Saving Leonardo, Total Truth, and the book that's right over there, Love Thy Body, which is the most recent book that she has out. So uh, hopefully, if you are uh, you like what you hear today, we'll go and go out and buy her book. That's what we want to, we want to make sure that people know about the book. So Love Thy Body. And we know, we know her from uh, when she was at Rivendell Sanctuary, which was in um, Bloomington, Minnesota, where my son Luke went to school for, what was it, two years, Luke? And a year and a half or so. And so... Luke had the uh, privilege of being one of her students, so that's how we got to know Nancy. So we, are, we appreciate you being on the program today. Thanks for coming. Thanks so much for having me. So what we're going to try to do today, rather than you hearing from me, which you often do, we're going to allow our staff and interns to ask questions uh, of, of, of Nancy. Uh, so without further ado, let's have our first question. Go ahead and step up. I want you to state your name and where you're from, and then ask the question. Go ahead. All right. Uh, I'm Lexi Hall, and I'm from Houston, Texas. So where you're from. Um, and my question is, is why do you think materialism is widely accepted? Materialism, you mean as a philosophy. You don't mean materialism as people want more material goods. Yes, right? first one. <laughs> materialism as a philosophy Really, the biggest impulse was Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. Materialism was around before that, but scientifically, it just didn't have all the answers, particularly life. Life is just too complex. And so for a long time, people who wanted to be materialist in their thinking knew that they didn't have a complete answer. And so for many people, it was Darwin's theory of evolution that helped them finally say, well, we've got a material mechanism now for the origin of life. So for many people, the scientific justification for materialism is Darwin, Darwinian evolution. And that's why it's such a cultural issue and has been ever since. It's, it's you know, been the, the flashpoint of so much controversy, n- not because of the science. The science isn't particularly strong for supporting Darwin, but because it was seen and is, continues to be used as a primary sub- scientific support for materialism. And why do, wanna, why do people want to be materialists? Was that really the underlying question? Um, for many people, um, it's the way to get rid of God. I mean, clearly, there's a book out um, uh, called the, the Psychology of Atheism, and the reason the author wrote the book is because for a long time, materialist uh, philosophers have said, well, the only reason people believe in God is because of their psychological needs. They have these emotional needs. You know, they want the comforting idea of a father figure in the sky. And so they just invent it. They project it. This was Freud's theory. It was so influential. Um, and so this other psychologist said, wait a minute. Maybe there's a psychology of atheism. Isn't it possible that some people just want atheism to be true because it meets their psychological needs? Because it's actually very, um, it can be very attractive to think I'm never going to be accountable to anybody for what I've done in my life. Uh, there's a, a Polish poet who became very famous, and he's and this he's a 
uh, being Polish, he was raised Catholic, but he said the attraction of materialism is never having to say, I'm sorry. All right. Once again, coming to you from the Created Equal office here in Columbus, Ohio, we're with Nancy Piercy. I exhort you to get her book, Love Thy Body. Next question coming up here. Okay. Give your name and where you're from, and then your question. Okay. My name is Ian Spencer, and I'm from here in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and my question is, uh, we've seen materialism lead to abortion and transgenderism and other things like that. Um, and so I was just wondering what you think might be coming next. Good question. <laughs> yeah, we don't Wait a minute, I just, that, <laughs> I just wrote a book on transgenderism and homosexuality. I just stopped there. <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> I um, but I, if you, it is an interesting question. It's something you, you want to look to the future and see what, where we might be headed. Um, the transgenderism has convinced so many people that... Your body doesn't matter. All that matters is your feelings. Right? I feel like a boy, even though maybe I'm biologically a girl, therefore I am a boy, or vice versa. And so it has taught people to place their identity in their sexual feelings and their, or their feelings of gender identity. And so if we continue on that route, and I think we will, I, I think that right now the... the, the um, Momentum is towards continuing the sexual revolution. I don't see any end to the sexual revolution right now. Mm. Um, I, I think that will probably go even further in terms of just, um, well, the language is gender queer, right? Where you, you don't have any gender identity. I'm not, you see younger people today starting to say, well, I'm not really male or female. I'm some, some sort of blend of them. Or I'm one way one day and one, one day the next. In my book, Love Thy Body, I actually had a couple of examples of people whose, gen, who, whose gender identity, as they experienced it, changed from day to day. There was a news account of a girl who was um, a named Annie who was 12. And some days Annie is a girl, and some days Annie is a boy. And when her uh, graduation was coming up, they bought both a dress and a tuxedo <laughs> because they didn't know what identity the child would claim that day. And so that's, I think, where we're heading. NPR did a program on this, in fact, where they interviewed high school students who s said, uh, I think the gender binary is an oppressive move by the dominant culture. <laughs> that was their wow. phrase. And then they said, the NPR reporter said, we encountered students whose gender was so fluid that they, in a single day, they would go to one event as one gender and to another event as another gender, you know, you know, you might be a boy for lunch and a girl for class afterwards. I think that's where we're heading right, right now, where people are so, so fluid in their understanding of gender that the, the definitions are going to just, the definitions will become more and more blurred. All right, next, next question. Again, I'm with Nancy Piercy, the author of several books, Total Truth, Saving Leonardo, and her most recent book, Love Thy Body. So I exhort you once again, go to Amazon and pick up the book. Uh, all right. Your name and your uh, and where you're from. Hi, my name is Grace. I'm from Defiance, Ohio. And oh, and my question, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Um, I'm a big fan. <laughs> my question is, uh, what do you recommend as good questions to ask people um, in street evangelism to bring out and challenge their worldviews? Which is what we do a lot of. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I I kind I dealt with that in my earlier book, Finding Truth. Have you you said you were a big fan? If you, have you read that one, Finding Truth? Ah, good, good. Read it. <laughs> um, when I when I have students come into my classroom, sometimes there there's so many different isms to learn, so many different worldviews to learn that they can get overwhelmed. And I say to them. If you read Romans 1, Paul says there that if you, if you reject the biblical God, you have to put something in its place. I mean, to think at all, you have to have a starting point. You have to presume something as the ultimate reality, right? The, uh, the uncaused cause of everything else, the source of everything. And so if you don't place the biblical God in that position, you're going to have to put something else there. 
And so that's why Paul says, if you don't worship the biblical God, you will worship something in creation. You make something in the created order part, uh, you know, uh, your, your God, your idol. Now, he was talking back then mostly about actual idols like golden calves. But modern people have idols too. Think of our earlier question about materialism. Is materialism an idol? Well, what does it say is the ultimate reality? It says matter is the ultimate reality. That's the uncaused cause of everything else. We're all derived from matter. And so it, it functions as the idol in, in the materialist worldview. So I tell my students, whenever you want to figure out what, you know, the starting point of any worldview, ask what's its idol. Everything else flows from that. And so I would say that in your conversations with people too. Ask the kind of questions that get at what do they think is the ultimate reality. A lot of people have, don't think in those terms, so you have to be creative in how you say it. You know, a lot of people are not very self-aware of their beliefs. So that, but that's what you want to get at, is what is their ultimate uh, belief? What do they think is the uncaused cause of everything else? The, the ultimate explainer. You know, if you want to explain the universe, what do you think is your ultimate explainer? The materialist says matter. Everything has to be reducible ultimately to matter. And so, or the, let's, I mean, t let's take a spiritual view. Let's take pantheism, Eastern thought. It says that ultimate reality is some sort of spiritual essence that permeates all things. And that's the, the ultimate reality. So, you know, you can do it with religions. You can do it with secular thought. But go for the idol. What is their idol? And even, say, do you know this? Even secular people use the word idol to mean, American yeah, yeah, American idol. I didn't quite mean it that way, though. <laughs> secular philosophers will say, they will sometimes say, whatever you propose as the ultimate cause of everything is your idol. And so it's not, it's not a religious term only. You, you can use it even with secular people. All right. You've tuned into the Mark Harrington Show. You can find out more going to markharrington.org. And I'm also the president of Created Equal. You can go to createdequal.org if you'd like to find out more. All right. Next question, name and where you're from, and then your question. My name is Esther. I'm from Columbus, Ohio. Um, my question is, what do you think the role of open hospitality is in engaging our individualistic culture? <laughs> Well, you're talking to someone who became a Christian at Labrie, <laughs> where that was a major part of the ministry uh, at Labrie. You know, students would just come and actually live there. And this was interesting because he didn't plan this. This was very organic. Uh, when Francis Schaeffer, you know, he was an evangelist, and he was working in, in Switzerland, but he was high in the Swiss Alps, in a very inaccessible place. And... And he was he was uh, teaching in churches and so on. But when his daughters went down the mountain, down the Alp, <laughs> to the Lausanne University, and they would talk to their friends about God, and the friends would ask them questions, and they'd say, "You ought to talk to my dad. <laughs> He's well good with questions like that." So they take the little train up the mountain, and because it was so inaccessible, they would just spend the whole weekend. And then they would go and tell their friends, and another group would come up, and then another group would come up, and pretty soon they had students sleeping in the hallways and the couches and the balconies, and it grew very organically into kind of a residential ministry where you would actually live and see a Christian community. You see a Christian, it started as a Christian family, and then as other people joined the ministry, they would just buy a home down the street, you know, a home across town. And Labrie was simply a group of chalets. Chalets are just what Swiss homes are. A group of chalets spread through this little Swiss village. Um, so I would tell you, I have to tell you, many people said that Labrie was an apologetics ministry, and it was very good at giving rational reasons and helping people see there were good arguments supporting Christianity. And, and when I went, I'd never heard of apologetics, and I was stunned. I never knew you could actually support Christianity with good arguments. You know, I thought it was blind faith. You know, so, that, so I was really impressed by the apologetics. But I have to tell you, the quality of love that we saw there, and many of the people who became Christians there said it was also the equality of love, that we saw a Christian community unlike anything we'd ever seen. 
back in the States. And that was equally, and I would say for myself too, that was equally persuasive. So I think your question is really good. How could we reproduce that to mm-hmm. some degree, you know, here in the States? You, you know, you don't have to go live on a Swiss Alp to do this. <laughs> How can you use, practice hospitality in your own home and, and help? You, you're ministering to the whole person that way, you know, not just to their mind. You're ministering to the whole person, and that's important. All right. Maybe we can just put some bunk bags in here or something like that. We could start that way. I don't know if that'll work in today's uh, bunk beds. We could just kind of, you know, put them up. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know if that'll work in today's uh, environment, actually. All right. Next question. Again, we're uh, with Nancy Piercy, author and professor at e- the Baptist University, uh, right? Houston Baptist. Houston Baptist, sorry. All right. Next question. Name and where you're from. I'm Nathaniel Paulus from Fort Wayne, Indiana, and my question is, how would you recommend talking to someone with a nihilistic worldview? All these hard, you know, these simple questions. Oh, that was a tough one because technically nihilism means you don't believe anything matters and that anything's true. You know what, since we're talking about Francis Schaeffer, you know what Francis Schaeffer would say to that? Nobody's really, really a nihilist. We're made in God's image, and so... If you were really a nihilist, you would say there's no moral, there's no morality and there's no truth. Does anyone really live like there's no morality and no truth? Nobody does. Everyone really does believe that some things are right or wrong. And it take, may take a while talking to them to figure out what they're really passionate about, but everyone is passionate about some things being really wrong. Or some, you know, the easiest way to do it is to say, is there anyone who's ever done something you thought was wrong? <laughs> Who says no? <laughs> Everyone says yes. Of course, that jerk down the road. <laughs> we, we all have somebody we think did something wrong. Um, and truth, well, nobody really lives without believing in truth either because if you did, you know, you'd jump in front of a moving truck. You know, you'd, you'd jump, into the, jump into the swimming pool and not hold your, nose, not hold your breath. You know? We, we know that there's a structure to the universe and that we have to live in harmony with that structure or we die. You know, it's, it's, nobody is really a nihilist. And so, so then you have to ask them, where did the nihilism come from? You know, what did they accept? Did they accept some form of materialism that then taught them that we're just complex biochemical machines who have no real sense of truth and morality? Where did it come from? What are they believing that taught them that nothing is true. <laughs> Somewhere back there was a premise that they accepted that led to the conclusion that nothing is true. So that would be the the way to get them back to where did, where did they come up with their nihilism? It's a it's a conclusion from some prior premise. And so that's what they're really believing. All right, good question. Next, name and where you're from. Hi, I'm Michael Lockwood from Chillicothe, Ohio. Um, today, earlier at the conference, you said that in order to prevent uh, transgenderism from developing in young children, your young children, um, the best option if they're not conforming to certain gender stereotypes is not to tell them that there's something wrong with them, but instead that the stereotypes are wrong. Correct? Okay, so my, my question is, where do you draw the line? Because clearly there's, there's a difference between a boy preferring house as, as opposed to baseball and a boy wanting to wear high heels and a dress and, and stuff like that. So where do you draw the line? Thank you. Yeah, th- that is a good question um, because the, the scientific studies do show clearly that the most common, the strongest correlate of non-heterosexual behavior in adulthood is gender nonconforming behavior in childhood. And it's much stronger than any genetic link. You know, people who say, well, you know, homosexuality is genetic. This is a much stronger link than any genetic. It's just kids who don't fit the stereotypes. Um, and so right now, it, when you say, how do you, how do you draw the line? Um, right now it's kind of anecdotal because transgenderism is still so new. And so, in some sense, I think finding the examples that sort of illustrate it is the easiest. Like the example I gave this morning uh, was um, a young man named Brandon, who, was, who clearly had gender dysphoria from a very young age. 
and how his parents affirmed him and saying, okay, right, you're gentle, you're quiet, you're relational. There's nothing wrong with that. You can be a boy and be gentle and quiet and relational. That does not mean you're a girl. And another example that he gave in the book is from a BBC documentary, and, and it's a girl. And for, at age two, she told her parents, I'm a boy. And when they refused to treat her as a boy, she would have falling down tantra, tantrums, tant temper tantrums. She was really aggressive about this. And her parents said it was like a war zone. Raising this kid was like a war zone because she would scream and she would take her fist and, and, and punch herself in the crotch and say, I'm a boy, I'm a boy. Fortunately, they did take her to a gender clinic that helped her to rethink whether there were more flexible ways of being a girl. You know, that you don't have to play with Barbie dolls and like pink in order to be a girl. That, that uh, you know, This was in Canada. So he, they said, you could play hockey. <laughs> you could play hockey and be a girl. Well, her parents finally at age eight took her to a softball team, a girl's softball team. And she said, oh my goodness, there's other girls like me. In fact, some of them are even more tomboyish than I am. <laughs> and this was the beginning of the change where she realized I can be tomboyish. I can like sports. And, and still be a girl. To me, I, I would have taken her to soccer at age two. You know? <laughs> I, I was a little surprised it took them till age eight. But it took, four, by the way, it took four years, Jill, for the turnaround. But by age 12, she had fully accepted her identity as a girl. So right now, it's more anecdotal like that. Find, we need to find stories where parents were willing to make the fight. It, it, it is a fight. It's not easy when your child is utterly convinced that they're the opposite sex. But there have been several cases like this where the child uh, outgrew it or their, their parents found helped them to get a more flexible definition of what it meant to be a boy or a girl. And of course, as you probably know, 80, some 80%, depending on the study, about 80% of, of young people outgrow their gender dysphoria just by going through puberty. Just, you know, the, the the rush of hormones that happens during puberty helps them emotionally connect with their natal sex. So it, it's, as a result, it's, I think it's irresponsible to move ahead with puberty blockers and things that are medically harmful when you know that some 80% outgrow it anyway in puberty. Right. Mark Harrington coming to you here from Columbus, Ohio with Nancy Pierce, who spoke at the Xenos Summer Institute today. And Nancy's a, an author and also a professor at Houston Baptist University. We got time for one more question, probably one more question for one of our interns. All right. Give your name and where you're from and your question. All right. Uh, so my name is Isaac. I'm from Grand Rapids, Michigan. My question is, when we're speaking to individuals who have pro chosen to be transgender, uh, do you think it's more appropriate to use pronouns that refer to their biological sex or the sex that they've chosen? You don't want to misgender them, right? That's what they say to us. You've misgendered me. You know, I, there are some things that are a matter of prudence. You know, prudence is a virtue. Mm -hmm. It's not a word we use very often. It sounds very medieval. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But it means that there are times when uh, you you judge which principle applies to a particular situation. An example, it would be, do you attend a homosexual wedding? Some people will, some people won't. Some, some Christians will, depending on the circumstances, and some won't. I think the transgender pronoun issue is somewhat like that, um, th that it's a matter of prudence uh, and a matter of courtesy. Um, you know, you know Jordan Peterson, who became very famous for obje female, no. <laughs> for for objecting. Well, he obje he's Canadian, and Canada passed a law uh, requiring transgender pronouns. Well, he objected to the coercion, he, but even he said, as a matter of courtesy, I will do that sometimes. Yeah, sure as a matter of courtesy on a one-to-one -one basis, where we need to be careful is when it becomes legally required because then it's coercive speech. And when the government starts telling you what you can say, the government starts controlling your, your thoughts. Totalitarian regimes have always done this. You know, they know that if they can control your speech, they can control your thinking. All right, we're going to have to wrap it up again with Nancy Piercy today. On the Mark Harrington Show, go to markharrington.org. 
You can find out more. I'm the president of Created Equal, and you can go to createdequal.org as well. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much. I enjoyed talking with your interns. And we'll hopefully see you. Yeah, give give her a hand. (laughs) We'll hopefully see you this summer or, or maybe in the fall sometime. All right. We'll see you next time. God bless you. God bless America. And remember America to bless God. You've been listening to Mark Harrington, your radio activist. For more information on how to become a witness against the evil, evil plague in America, call Created Equal at 614-269-7808, 614-269-7808, or go online to createdequal.net, createdequal.net. Be sure to tune to The Mark Harrington Show next time for your marching orders in the culture war.